bears We're determined and we just don't care Who we play or who we maul Not stop until we've had dinner We're mean, we're on the prowl Our team's gonna knock them out Everybody's gonna scream and shout The red and blacks are gonna make us proud So beware of the bears and bees One of the sensations of the year was posted by North Sydney, but certainly in a way they would not have wished. The Bears' biggest battles in 1985 were fought off the field as the club struggled with internal problems. From reserve grade coach to top man at North's in one season, Brian Norton was given the difficult task of motivating a team already out of Winfield Cup contention. I don't like to get involved in the political side of it. Uh, as far as Mr McCaffrey, Mr Kevin Ma standing down, uh, North Sydney's heading for a new era. Uh, now that they've elected a coach for next year, uh, at this early stage, we can now show a sign of direction. And that's what the players have been looking for, is direction. When I came in as a stand, stand-in coach, it still wasn't positive that North Sydney had a leader. Uh, they had no direction. And now they have got direction, maybe we can take giant steps forward towards 1986. At the end of last season, we lost a lot of valuable players in the club and they weren't replaced by any uh, players with a lot of talent. Uh, we've got a lot of fine competitors in the club and we've got also a lot of fine up and coming juniors that have come up into the ranks this year. But we haven't had was players with experience and I think that's very important that uh, North Sydney look forward to 1986 to buy players with experience. We're still there. We'll still be there when the world ends, if you want to call it that. Well, our long, die-hard, suffering supporters I can promise them that they'll see a new brand of football next year, 1986. Yeah, I, I came from Queensland, Queensland country, a small place called Miriam Vale. Um, very small place. Um, I, I played all my junior football in Gladstone, Queensland, uh, from under sevens right through to under 19s and then was approached by North Sydney. I came from a, a very small country town called Wollongar, which was uh, on the Queensland New South Wales border. Um, <clears throat> very conservative country family, just, just working class. My father was a labourer for his whole life. My mother was a type of country lady that d devoted her life to her husband and bringing up four boys. Um, in a town like that, there was not much to do other than play sport. Um, there was there was no other fun at all. You had to make your own own fun. And being the youngest of four boys, I had three older bullies that used to uh, teach me how to a bit of discipline. So that, that was good. It was a great way to grow up. <clears throat> I'd hope my children had the same sort of upbringing. It was a wholesome country upbringing where you really knew the difference between need and want. You know, you, you, your parents gave me what I needed, and every now and then I got what I wanted. I think predominantly. Queensland, especially early on, obviously it may have changed in the last couple of decades, but you go back even to the 60s and, and, and 50s, it was a very working class state. It um, probably wasn't, it was nowhere near as wealthy a state as New South Wales and, and Victoria and didn't have as much old money. And I think it was a lot of workers up in Queensland. And that's where the strongholds of rugby league are in, um, in, in the rural areas um, and also in the working class areas of Brisbane. And I remember watching the first State of Origin when I was nine years old in Wollongarra and instantaneously I thought, I identified with this. I loved it. It was so passionate. And if Queenslanders love State of Origin for this reason, and they, they go well for this reason, Queenslanders play State of Origin to beat New South Wales. New South Wales players play State of Origin to get picked to play for Australia. Once I started playing in under sevens and started making a few representative sides, junior representative sides, um, started getting the taste of the game and um, you know you'd, you'd watch the, the the Brisbane competition then every Sunday night because we, well, we never got the Sydney competition on television but it was the Brisbane competition we used to watch every Sunday and I, I aspired to be like 
the back then, young Mel Meningas, the Gene Miles, the Wally Lewis. You know, they, they were playing in the Brisbane competition and they were at their prime. When I, fir I first heard about North Sydney, probably when, when we when they started televising um, uh, New South Wales Rugby League on, on, on the ABC in, in our country area. Um, I think it might have been about 82 or that they made a semi-final. And I liked their jerseys. <laughs> My early days in rug uh, rugby league were in Bundaberg, a uh, little town where Bundaberg Rum was made famous. And that's where I played uh, most of my uh, serious junior football, in school football, and for the Brothers Club there. And um, uh, essentially that's where I kicked off and went into the Brisbane competition, uh, where I played for Fortitude Valley, and um, the Valleys Club, which is a famous club in Brisbane. In 1985, I played for them. Well, it was basically, it was that phone call from Dennis, and. I guess that was 90, uh, 85, um, and he, he rang up and said, we need you down here, do you want to have a run? So I turned up the next day, I think I got 15 or 20 minutes on the wing, and the next week I was selected on the wing, I think it was against Illawarra, um, and you know, from there on in, that was it. I turned up, I trained hard with them, I played the rest of the season, 85, um, there, and then started 86 in reserve grade. 1985, it was a case of um, applying for their position at North Sydney Leagues Club. North Sydney Leagues Club was the, uh, and, and still is, the benefactor to the football club, but it was strictly a leagues club. End of 1985, I went and saw Ken McCaffrey after the end of the season, and sitting there with Ken, he said, you had a good year, didn't you? Because those days, I was getting match payments, so I think it was $50 a win in under 23s, if you want, for the first 12 you won, I can't remember the business. No, pocket money. We played for love and it was great fun. And at the end of the year he said, uh, you had a good year, well, you think you'll sign you up for next three years? I thought, yeah, okay. I didn't, I didn't wait, just whatever he said, yeah, that'll do. I said, oh, just for last year, here's $1,000. He wrote out a check there for me on the spot for $1,000. I thought that was the biggest windfall in my life. I thought, that's great. The Leeds Club was uh, not travelling too well. It had, uh, in 85, 86, it, um, it had about 13 or 14,000 members. It was uh, experiencing um, difficulty. It had one or two um, constraints placed on its uh, spending and uh, by the bank. And uh, it had to be realigned into the culture that needed it to be, funny enough, a, um, a successful lease club in the, eight, the late 80s and certainly for the, the, uh, the 90s. And that was achieved, but uh, it was a bit spooky. <laughs> in my uh, playing days in, in Bundaberg, I played for the Brothers Club. And one of the uh, great figures at that club uh, was a guy called Noel Kavner. And that was my introduction to North Sydney. Uh, I was quite successful in my early playing days um, at Bundaberg. And Noel, being an ex-bear from uh, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, actually put my name forward to the club uh, and I did not know this at the time yet I always knew that Noel played for the Bears and, and had that minor interest with the Bears although it wasn't the team that I actually followed in the Sydney competition. I was employed as an development officer uh, in very early 85 and I spent the first uh, nine months doing that and uh, there was some problems at board level and there was an upheaval in the board and uh, and Kim McCaffrey, who was the then, then club secretary, um, departed the scene. And uh, I was asked to take over as acting uh, chief executive of the club secretary, as they were known as those days. Um, and the first task, of course, was to look to see who was signed for 1986. And we had one player. Uh, Mark Graham was the only player that was on contract at that particular stage. So it was a fairly enormous task, and, and North didn't have any money. Uh, money was very, very scarce. And so it was a fairly uh, difficult task in, uh, in putting together some players that could play first grade. And with Brian Norton, who was uh, the appointed coach at the time, we, we got it together and uh, we worked uh, a lot of long hours in putting together a side that, uh, that eventually uh, got beaten a playoff uh, for the semis for 1986. I was appointed as uh, development manager with the North City Football Club 
uh, taking over from Bob Thorne as a move to the chief executive. That role in those days, there were three of us running the football club. There was uh, Bob, myself and Pat Baker as a secretary. And so the development manager did, did virtually everything. I was, I was deputy chairman with Kevin Maher at the time. Kevin was a good president, but he announced in the papers that he was going to stand down as president. And I thought, you now I'd, I'd been deputy chairman with Kevin and with, with um, Harry McKinnon. I thought, now if I don't stand for president now, I might as well get out altogether. Ken McCaffrey had negotiated with Martin Bella and Gavin Jones. So they were two players that were already coming to North. And uh, so we, we, we had gained those two players. We also needed a halfback because we'd lost Mitchell Cox. So Clayton Friend from New Zealand was another player that was added. And um, also Alson Filipana. I've got to say, this chicken, and I hope I don't offend him. He wasn't the best coach I've ever had, but very good motivator. motivator. He, made you, uh, he made you feel like playing, which was, was probably nine-tenths of it. We went to, um, to Queensland to try to sign up Peter Jackson, the centre, for, um, for, the, for the Brisbane side at that particular time, and um, also uh, uh, Brett French. We were trying to get those players to come down to play for the North Sydney Bears. Well, we were unfortunate that we'd missed out on Peter Jackson because he was on the Canberra side had picked him up and we'd picked up uh, Brett French, he was coming, and also um, a player that we didn't have any intentions of buying, but I was talking to some players in Brisbane at the particular time and I was doing a bit of talent scouting my name came up again through Brian Norton. He checked the files, uh, saw that Noel Kavanagh had recommended myself, and um, that created the interest again. And obviously they had heard my name in the Brisbane competition, and it eventuated that the Bears came to me, and um, I signed with them in 1985 and for the 1986 and 1987 season. Kick, high, long, straight between the uprights. First points of the match goes to North Sydney. North Sydney cheer girls. Friend, Philippina. Philippina, a bumping run. It's going to be a try. Yes! Scored by Rex Wright, the hooker. After Philip Piner. They keep up this wrap to the left, and it's a little kick ahead by Hanson. Well, for mine, he's been the best North Sydney player by lengths. Philip Piner. Five tackles gone now for the Bears. They may, they may go for another drop goal. Cannon is wide. Friend puts the kick in. Oh, this man is coming fast for Remo. That's a try. That's a try for Greg Florimo. What he was doing was sitting on the reserves bench waiting for a game in first grade. But what he was doing <laughs> on the reserves bench was a thing that got him into trouble. Here he is, Freddie D. Teestel, playing, playing with the yo-yo. That's right. And You're as a result, Fred, team, Fred got the $100 fine. That's but he right. made first grade this That's week. That's right, and that didn't help either, because <laughs> they got flogged this afternoon <laughs> by South Sydney. <laughs> Someone's lost their sense of humour there. Oh, that's quite funny, I think. I'd find him 100 bucks for that. Hey? He's playing with his yeah, yeah. I mean, it could have been anything. Could have been playing with a rugby ball, couldn't he? Mark Cannon. Mark was uh, a great clubman, great player, and uh, a great asset to uh, to North Sydney Bears. Yeah, Mark, Mark, Mark Cannon. All the boys we did have were, were I thought, were, uh, were were excellent. Well, even their three missing State of Origin stars could have lifted them sufficiently to match it with the Bears, who kept the Tigers trialless. It's the first time in three years that the Bears have beaten Balmain, and the score of 16-7 to 7 probably flattered the Tigers. Tigers. Norths looked to be up to their old tricks when Peter Cross gave away a senseless penalty and was given ten minutes in the sin bin for his trouble. And Ross Conlon from back near halfway had Balmain fans smiling for one of the few moments in the game. In the second half, it was as if Balmain had shut up shop and Mark Graham went through a gaping hole. Easy! Walk through them! But Balmain's defence fell away as North's prop Martin Bella did it with ease. And Bella's over! He scored! 
It was a fine North Sydney win, and Balmain coach Stanton looks to be already contemplating changes. Congra uh, congratulations on your win, Cheers. and thanks for coming along. I've noticed you do a funny thing when you score a try. Now, you score enough tries, you always land heavily on one knee. Are you aware of that? Yeah, uh, after watching that, yeah. You're going to do some damage to your knee scoring a try one of these. I'm serious. I've, uh, in a match there, I can't remember the game, you ran a long way, about 60 yards at North Sydney Oval not so long ago, and you fell right on your right knee, and then your, sort of your body erupted up another two feet in the air after. I reckon you'll do serious damage. I'd cut that out. I'll just get some more practice than I think, Rich. They 43 tackles, horrendous load for the, uh, for the players to carry. This pass did go forward from MacArthur to Kiss, otherwise he was in for his second try. Florimo, Kiss, talking about Myler, we all know that he's uh, an astonishingly gifted player. And there's your try. Gee, that was a nice bit of football. There's that knee again. That <laughs> knee, you're going to, one of these days, you're going to say, I wish I'd take a notice of Rex Mossop about that knee when you have all the cartilages removed out of your right <laughs> knee and all the ligaments strained and torn away from the bone. <laughs> oh, geez, you blokes won't take notice. And uh, what about your, uh, your old prop forward there? Not old, uh, Bella from young, Queensland. Exactly. Young, young, only a lad. Yeah. You've got to say 1986 was a great year for the Bears because not only myself but uh, Gavin Jones went into representative football, um, Martin Bella uh, who went in the kangaroo tour with myself at the end of that season. Um, well, we attracted um, a guy called Greg Lennon who has since passed away in that year uh, in 1986. Um, from Rugby Union. A sizeable slice of the code's history passed on when the Sydney sports ground was bulldozed to make way for the new headquarters in the spectacular shape of the Sydney Football Stadium. The old sports ground was unique in so far that it was the only arena in Sydney to run east-west, meaning that for half of the game you'd have to contend with the afternoon sun in your eyes, which often made life difficult. As tenants of a ground that hosted several grand finals, it was fitting that Eastern Suburbs emerged with victory in the Sydney sports ground's final assignment. Fullback Gary Worth scored three tries in the first 20 minutes as the Roosters held out North Sydney 21 points to 14. It was a lovely pass. He's streaking away. Brian Johnson can't get him from behind. And it's going to be a North City try when they needed one. After a game, we all, all the partners and uh, players would get together and go and have a meal or a drink somewhere. And uh, we enjoyed our football. And that's what made us uh, a pretty good team, I felt. In the middle of a hard, gruelling training session, he'd suddenly bring out a birthday cake for Freddie Tees. Um, and everyone would sing happy birthday. And he had these types of um, um, approaches that really, really did make it enjo an enjoyable place to be. And training uh, was tough and uncompromising, uh, but there was a purpose about what we were, we were going to do. We wanted to go out there and, and be the best we can. Well, here's the action with North Sydney. Don McKinnon there. They've got a very big pack of forwards. Gavin Jones is having a tremendous season. Clayton Friend, of course, uh, justifiably exonerated after being sent off last week on a high but not dangerous tackle. Mark Graham's the man who can do so much and Martin Bell is having a great season in the pack for Norths. And Gavin Jones, I think he can pretty well book a passage on that kangaroo tour at the end of the year. He's been one of the form players of the season. He continually breaks the line and sets the play up and he's getting more and more skillful in the way he uh, sets up the play. The Panthers without David Lydiard and John Cartwright today. Ken Wolfe and Gary Howell have taken their place. And Greg Alexander, despite a, a knee injury problem, is in the side. And as we've mentioned before, he's the man upon they depend so much for the inspiration. Matt Goodwin, after coming from uh, West Wyalong, has uh, had some tremendous games with the Penrith side. And when he's fired up, he crashes through and sets it up beautifully. Graham West in charge today. The Bears to kick off a magnificent day here at North Sydney Oval. So Penrith in possession on their quarter line. And that's Goodwin feeding it, setting it up to Connor. Roy Simmons at dummy half. Daryl Broman. Broman who's slimmed down a little this year. Been very, very fit and sharp. Big contributor, Brandon Lee. Rangy second rower. Good kicking game he's got as well. Now, the clearance from Greg Clements. Down to Paul Conlon, who's taken over at fullback this week. MacArthur's on the wing and Butler back in reserves. And Conlon's had plenty of first grade experience. Couple of handling blues from North. Mark Graham and then uh, Gavin Jones, three times they've 
drop the merchandise. And the reason why they dropped it, Jim, is because the player took their eyes off the ball, more intent on looking at the man, the man coming towards him. And let's face it, in these opening 12 minutes, there's been a lot of high tackles. Alexander, look out! Here he goes, and he's in! Oh, a gap as wide as the heads. Wasn't that the easiest try you'll ever see? He's 10th of the season. Organising the switches of direction. That's Green. Now watch for Alexander in the play here somewhere. There he goes. What a ball, and the Howell scores. Howell scores off Alexander. A regulation move, beautifully executed, and Gary Howell swamped them under the posts. Friend, Jones. Jones not uh, cutting loose as yet as he did last week. Graham's good ball to French. He's made a bit of a break. Kiss is now up to halfway. He also showed down that touchline, but in the touch. He's down on the sideline with Debbie's playing Rex Wright. Rex, last time we saw you, you were writhing around on a stretcher. What's the latest on that injury? Um, I've got another four to six weeks in plaster and, uh, and probably another four five weeks before I can uh, start moving around on it again. What's the, uh, the setback for Norths has been the loss of you around the dummy half. Can you explain to uh, the viewers what, what the actual significance of that dummy half role? It may look pretty basic, but it's very important. Yeah, um, we've uh, just got to set up all the play and, and it may, may look um, basic to most of the viewers, but uh, you know, there's certain moves that, that uh, the hooker only knows about and he's got to uh, sort of control that sort of play. So you're basically calling the shots when you're out there? Um, yes, me and Clayton uh, out in the field call most of the moves in the, in the general play. And that's that picturesque North Sydney ground. And there where we are on the scaffold, that new stand is going to have a number of shops opening out onto the street. And it'll be the, the Strand Arcade with a football field, they tell me, when it's finished, Steve. It certainly looks nice, doesn't it? Friend, a good dash. He's cut through them. Just a metre short. A nice little step from Clayton Friend. Tackle by Clements. Right on the boil. It's Cannon. He sets it up. Philip Hayner. And he's over the line. And he's got it down. Big Olsen. With those chocolate pillars of his, known as legs, has got through. He scored near the upright, and Norse are back in the hunt. Certainly on good play. You can put this try down to Clayton Friend, that individual stuff, but a good switch back inside. The strength of the Kiwi takes him over. Bella. And Bella rips it up. The North Sydney supporters cheering their bears now as they start to surge forward. Graham's long ball. For Remo slipped it. Here's Kiss. Little as Kiss. He's flying down there. He comes to Robards. Back inside it goes, and it's a try to Cannon. Mark Cannon has scored. And that was just what Mike Stevenson was talking about. Getting it out wide. And Les Kiss, who's got so much pace, was able to set it up for Cannon. It's amazing what a little bit of confidence can do for you. And a long pass from Graham. And watch this ball, that's a beautiful pass. That's good play by the young centre. And Kiss, dearie me, French was beautiful play. And this is out of backup man. And he'll thoroughly enjoy that, Mark Cannon. The crucial point most both coaches are talking about at half time is control of the ball. Both coaches want to see more of that from their side in the second half. In the North's camp, they say they've overcome the silly mistakes of the first 20 minutes of this game. They want the forwards to continue running straight and hard as they did in the first half, to, towards the end of the first half, that is, move the ball out wide and create gaps. Tim Sheens also says the gaps will come wide if his team move the ball around. He wants uh, more work from the markers. He says that was in the match plan. They're not sticking to it. And his final words was, if Norths are defending, we'll win. Thanks, Debbie. So Norths with a slight wind assistance in this half. And Mark Graham goes forward, tackled by Connor, Simmons and Broman. That's Friends ball. Charging ahead, Gavin Jones. You often see the linking between those two, trying to inspire a big burst from Jones. Now it's Bella back into the middle. Support from Lindsay. 
So a lively start in the second half for North who lead 14-12. Cannon, a quick dummy and a quick a a kick ahead into space. Robards caught out of position. Cannon's charging after this. Robards has got it and Cannon's got him in goal. What a start by North Sydney. Well, that's about the uh, most enthusiastic start to a half of football we've seen from North for a while and it's paid off because they'll get the ball back from a drop under the post. Steve -o. Great play by the lock forward. He said that forwards don't have brains. You can see Robards well out of position. Instead of going for touch, kick it downfield. It's Conlon. Conlon has had a few good rushes from the back at the defence. Bella. That's Kiss. Look at him go. Really elusive. Howell dropped it. And Norse have got, Norse have got it back with a uh, tackle recount. Lindsay. Straight ahead. Setting up position. Penrith just a little rattled at the moment. Friend. That's Jones. Jones gallops ahead. Look at French. He's in. Gavin Jones and Brett French. What a difference all these Queensland players are making. Brett French, Gavin Jones and Les Kiss, but that time it was Jones and French. North further ahead. Good play by the second rower. He's a big fellow, the second. He's beautiful ball out wide. French had no intention of looking for the man. He knew he had the speed. It's Les Kiss with a, an awkward kick on the angle. He's hit it well. The breeze is bringing it through the post for two points. Beautifully judged kick from Kiss. So North, an eight-point lead. Gary Howell. North charging up to make the tackles. Here's the last one. Alexander. Izzard's chasing it. Conlon's got it. He gets around Izzard. And Conlon, another strong run back. Brian Norton obviously looking for a, a bit more strength at the back this week. Put Conlon there and MacArthur to the wing. Mark Graham almost getting over the tackle and delivering it. He keeps it going. And Penrith inside the five. And perhaps a chance for Kiss to have a shot at goal from this. Well, Les Kiss, he's hit it well. It's another fine kick. Look at that. Two more points. Ten ahead. Now the Bears. Penrith have won a few games from this position during the year. Alexander's been the spark. What a pass. Izzard. Izzard keeps it going. That's Howell. There's Green. And they've scored it. Well, there you are. A vital kick this could be. He's hit it beautifully. Two more points, and the game's on again. Just four points between the Bears and the Panthers. 16 minutes left in the match. 22-18. No, he's played the advantage. Looked like there was going to be a scrum. Now Norse. Graham Murchie, the replacement for Clayton Friend. What a loss he's been. McKinnon. McKinnon's made a good run here. Don McKinnon. That's like the old days of running on the cricket pitch when they wouldn't tackle him here. He ran about 20 metres. Murchie wide. Cannon. Squeeze ball. The best form of defence is attack. Tight head. Filipina. That's Cannon standing out wide. Oh, terrible. Look at this. He's given it away. It should be a try. And Alexander cut down a metre short. There's still a chance. It's loose. It's a penalty. They're all offside. North's all offside. But what a terrible mistake by Mark Cannon out in the backs there. And Alexander, but for this last-minute tackle from French, was in. And then you'll see North up on the blind side. They're all offside there. And it had to be a penalty. The penalty, of course, goes to Penrith. Graham gets a caution. It's desperate stakes for Penrith. Ackery charges ahead. Charge ahead, close to the line. Gerard pulled back. 
Alexander. Caught by the defence. There's the siren, it's all over. The Bears have won. The Bears have done it. What a win for the Bears. And for once this season, when Penrith have got close in the last 20 minutes, they haven't been able to produce the magic to pull the game out of the fire. But it's been a tremendous afternoon here, and North Sydney keep their slim semi-final hopes alive. Certainly they're a lot brighter after this effort. Steve-O. Don McKinnon, very, very good indeed. And, of course, man of the match, Les Kiss. His goal kicking, in the end, told the difference. Two magnificent goals under a lot of pressure. Mark, for second week in a row, you've held off a team fighting back in the second half. Do you think you've finally kicked that image of uh, the team that tries hard to lose? Well, yeah, I think so. We've got a lot of good players. Uh, like I've been saying all along, we've got, there's only about two players that haven't been in a state play or represented at some level within the side. So I think uh, we're going to go places. Why were things so rocky in that first 20 minutes? Oh, they seem to have all the ball. Uh, we gave away a succession of penalties and they had all the ball and we were, we were uh, defending our own line. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I was very pleased with the way the boys went today. They showed a lot of commitment and heart. Penrith seemed to lose their cool a bit out there in the second half. Was that the way you saw it? Uh, well, you know, we lost our cool when we were up there last time. We got beaten 28-0. It was a pretty hard game. And it was very hot, so this time it was our turn. OK, thanks, Mark. I have to stop meeting like this. Yeah. <laughs> everyone got on well. Everyone, like, a lot of new blokes were there, and so they had their partners, so there was no no established sort of big click that we no one could feel happy and comfortable with, so everyone got on really well. So, And I think that shows if you can get on, on well off the field, it goes through into your football. If to combine a side together, you've got to find out where e each individual player's problems are, and you've got to respect that. And once he knows that you respect what job he's got to do, apart from his football, you can communicate with him. Show no communication and just want all the attention and respect yourself. You're not going to get any respect from those players. Well, Brian Norton as coach, he gave me, really gave me my first break. He was my first coach. I remember the night he called out the team and I was selected. At, we were down at Tunks Park training and, um, you know, that was a great moment again. And I, was, and I thought, wow, I'm, I'm really going to give this a shot. Checker brought him up as a youngster and uh, I can remember playing the Bulldogs at Belmore. And it was always a pretty hard clash with us because they liked coming straight at you and we liked going straight at them. So it was, uh, there wasn't a lot of science involved. And it was the best uh, team standing at the death. And, um, just before we went out into the football field, I saw him put on a skull cap, which are pretty common nowadays, admittedly. And I went over and said, listen, mate, we don't, we don't wear any of that sort of stuff here. And, you know, we're, uh, we, don't, we don't like that because we'd just say if someone else was wearing one of them, we'd be targeting. And he said, oh, good, he's gone and took it off. And I think he was only 17 or 18 at that stage. And, uh, a good North Sydney young man. And uh, Chicky came over and said, mate, what have you said to him about that? And I said, oh, mate, I, was, I just told him he didn't like that sort of thing, you know, the, the skull cap. He said he fell off his skateboard yesterday and he's got 16 stitches in his head. So I went over and said, mate, it's all right, you can put that back on. We found out later that he had headgear on because he, he'd fallen off his skateboard and cut himself. So uh, that sort of heralded uh, a pretty good patch for North Sydney with the birth of this kid called Florimer. Uh, we play the North Sydney Oval. We beat them fairly convincingly, but this kid showed some, some potential. And uh, I've got to say, uh, you don't often remember players uh, at a young age, but I remember him. He's got to give to Murchie and then to Bella. Beautiful tackle by Mays. Cannon's the dummy half. Up and Adam goes Gavin Jones. Good run by the big state of Orange and player. Five tackles gone for the Red and Blacks. Cannon puts the kick up. Murchie's going to prove menacing. Oh, it's been put down by Casado. It's a try. It's a try for the Bears. I believe Murchie. It may have been Cannon, but I'll certainly have a look at it with you on the replay. I believe it was the little halfback as we see the congratulations go round. Casado couldn't hold it. And then the little number seven gets his hands to it. It'll split very easily. It's gone across now to Sterling. Then on, oh, Price. Well, Jones got a hip on Price, and that, that hurt the, uh, that hurt the Parramatta lot. Five gone. Here's the hit again. It's just simply a shoulder and, and hip charge on Price. 
Played back to Ray Price. Casato. Price is still not 100% as I watch him retire back to the blind. It goes to Sterling, then to Kenny. There's... Oh, Bugden! Heavens above, Gavin Jones has hit him. He's hit him with another hip and shoulder charge, similar to the one on Price. And now Mosley can't handle. Kenny's inside the 32. Casado's going for the corner. He's pulled down six metres out. The siren sounds. It's all over. The Bears have won. The Bears led 12-8 at half-time and ran in three tries to Cronulla's one. A Nigel Tate try midway through the second half assured North of victory and a playoff against Balmain on Tuesday night. As for the Sharks, they'll be hoping that they can avoid the league's acts and still be a part of the Premiership in 1987. You know, North then uh, started to become a force again in the Premiership. They got up to the last game where Norse had won uh, their last three and we had to play Balmain uh, for a playoff to, uh, to see which Sigers were both equal, equal fifths, we both finished equal fifth and we played off that night at the uh, Sydney Creek ground and unfortunately um, Norse went into that game with a lot of injury. We had Mark Graham on the sideline, Alston Filipana, Clayton Friend, Gavin Jones, <laughs> all the players that we that we needed, they had been on the paddock, we certainly would have won that game and gone on to bigger things that particular year. Early ball then to give uh, Connor the opportunity to put Davidson away. This is David Brooks now, bumping his way over, 22 metre line, Davidson, Davidson, yes, it's a try! Scored by John Davidson in front of the MA Noble corner. Could be some... In, some uh... Problems there with the uh, the neck area of John McArthur. They win the scrum. The fullback comes in, Conlon, but again they're running across the ground, North Sydney. Here's Cannon now, wrapping it around the same way, but they're outnumbered out there. Well, what's happening? The Balmain defence is moving up very quickly out in the centres, and Mark Cannon's the man for North that's got to find some answers. He's been shut out. He's outside men. He can't get the ball to them. He's got to find some variety in his play. Now, you can beat that sort of tactic in defence if you've got the right tactics in attack. He can bring a man short off the outside. He can throw an inside pass, or he can kick in behind the defensive line as it comes up quick. Slides away now to MacArthur. That was knocked backwards and Casey comes up with the ball. Playing in the number three jumper. Gets to the 22. MacArthur! MacArthur! He's going to score! Yes, MacArthur scores for North Sydney! The Bears have gone in with the equaliser and uh, most definitely they will convert from right in front. Johnny MacArthur. And Paul Conlon will take the attempt at conversion. 15 metres out. And this is just what Balmain didn't need. They didn't need to let North Sydney put their nose in front because the Bears, well, they love wheeling and dealing. There's the conversion. North Sydney lead in the playoff by six to four. And here's a good chance for the Tigers. One by the by, by your Balmain, away to bridge and on to Conlon. Conlon cuts out Sky, but Gary Jack, Gary Jack has put himself into a hole. But what a great tackle by Conlon. The ball goes to the blind. Bridge turns it inside for Conlon to come back to the open. Back to Gary Jack. Gary Jack is a metre from the line. The Tigers throwing it on now, trailing six to four. Gale, Schofield, intercepted by Conlon, but he's offside. Five tackles gone for Balmain as the ball is kicked by Gale, but that's an ordinary kick, and Les Kiss comes back outside the 22. Pile on the pace, Les. Oh, he's got space he here. comes outside the 32. He goes away from Serenum. He's over the 40. He's over the half. He's gone 15 metres down into Balmain's territory. Les Kiss brings the North Sydney fans to their feet. Now they spin it wide. MacArthur's turned inside. Finds Casey now. Casey tackled by Hardwick. Back to Kiss. Richard Smith. McKinnon. Teasels the dummy half. Smith again. Kiss. Kiss. Away from two. Got the ball away for Teasel. Teasel tackle just outside the 22 line. And only uh, 35 seconds of the first half remaining. They'll probably go for the air. It's a drop goal attempt by Cannon. It doesn't look bad. It's a goal! It's a drop goal for Mark Cannon! 
the centre, Casey is having a finger that uh, jumped out. He's the trainer and he are going through a fair bit of agony. As a matter of fact, I think the trainer's in more pain than Casey. Ooh. Anyway, I shouldn't laugh, but it's a common injury that footballers suffer. Played back to Schofield, away now for Gale to Hardwick. Hardwick gets under Jones and he goes to the 22 line. And Jones is hurt, and he's hurt that right forearm as Elias stands in a tackle, the ball to Gale, then to Bevan. Bevan's to the 10 metre line. They're gone here, North, I don't think they can hang on. They're 10 metres out. It's gone from Scott Gale back into Kevin Hardwick, and Hardwick is held by Conlon for one and by uh, Kiss for another. Away for Benny Elias, he puts the drop goal over. Yes, it's a goal for Benny Elias. Seven all between the Tigers and the Bears at the SCG. The drop goal by Benny Elias on the NEC replay. Seven, seven. What would that pay on footy tap? Well, Gavin Jones, he's done his right arm. So uh, we had one little bloke called Scotty Gale just cut us apart there in just a couple of couple of goes, and that was the end of that section. But and then he ended up coming to the club here. Now with Scott Gale, he puts the little kick over. Lee gathers. Here's Gale. He kicks again. Gale. He's chasing hard. I think he'll do it. He did. Scott Gale scores a sensational try. I remember hearing about North Sydney, I think it was 1986, I remember at my friend's place, when they got beaten by Balmain in a playoff for fifth spot in semi-final. Gavin Jones broke his arm, Scotty Gale had a good game, uh, but they obviously missed the, um, the semi-finals just, it might have been at the Sydney football stadium, or Sydney uh, cricket ground. That's when I first heard of um, North Sydney, and also uh, one of the, the great players, the players that I grew up admiring, uh, Mark Graham, obviously followed his career intensely and I used to have a, a soft spot for Olsen Filipina. Um, he was an amazing athlete because he's the only player I ever saw play at the top of Wally Lewis. No one, ever else, no one else did it and the fact that he could come out of reserve grade, um, he was playing first grade at Norse, reserve grade at Belmain, could come out and play at the top of Wally Lewis, he, he was an interesting character as well. You know I have fond memories of 86, it was a good season for me. I scored a lot of tries. I played with some great players in, in the reserve grade finals. I mean, Olsen Filipina was there. Um, I formed a good combination with Andrew Simons. I was playing centre at the time. And some, not, you know, some unknown players as well, but together we formed a good side. And I think Dennis Constantine um, was duly the cause of that. He's, he had a great philosophy on coaching and um, he brought the best out in the team and we really, really wanted to play for him. Um, it was unfortunate we got knocked out. I thought we could have gone a little bit further, but. Uh, um, you know, it was a good, it was a nice taster for me and it was a good opener and, uh, um, you know, it, was, it stood me in good stead for the years to come. But as it was going on into the season, I started thinking about, well, if I prove myself here that I can get North Sydney to at least to the grand final uh, or into the finals, that uh, I'll earn my position so as a first grade coach for next year and, and uh, so I, I, I worked hard at it and then I, I fronted the board halfway through the season and I did ask them about next year and uh, there was not, um, that, I was virtually told just to worry about what I'm doing now and uh, that we'd talk about that later at the end of the year and uh, so that's what I did. But um, as we all know, um, that uh, Norse uh, had signed um, at that particular time was rated the best coach in the world was Frank Stanton. And um, uh, Frank was um, at that particular time coaching Balmain and uh, North Sydney uh, had signed Frank Stanton to come over because they had looked at the opportunity in a lifetime is to, is to get probably someone who, who was coached at his level, a very high level, because he took the Australian side to, uh, which they called the Invincibles, uh, to coach. But, however, there was one thing that I feel that they had did this a lot earlier in the season and hadn't told me, hadn't weren't fair with me. And uh, I must say this, that, I, that on, uh, on the night that we played Balmain, 
because I feel if we had won that game, there would have been no doubt North Sydney would have went on to challenge for that premiership that particular year because the players that we had set, sitting on the sideline that are out injured, unable to play for that particular game, would have been better for would have been able to the following week, and uh, our, our strength and our and, and our backup would have been uh, would have been great, but it just wasn't meant to be on that particular night. Well, at the end of 1986, um, having been at Balmain for six years, it was it was um, time for me to um, to take a break away from from that club and. Uh, um, when that was announced, it, I was offered um, a, to come and discuss the uh, position at North Sydney. And uh, I really wasn't planning to coach when I'd finished at Belmont. I was planning to have a bit of a spell, but uh, the offer came and uh, so I went down and discussed it and uh, um, ended up, um, was offered the job, so I decided to take it. Um, it was a three-year deal, and uh, and um, uh, I quite uh, was looking forward to it. Actually, I, I yeah, I felt hurt. There was a lot of hurt. There was a lot of hurt everywhere. There was hurt in my home. There was hurt everywhere. But see, but it's a business, and uh, you, you know, you, once the games I come back, football teaches you a lot. Team game teaches a lot. You might get hurt, but you you got to get back up again and. Um, you don't sit around and whinge and everything like that. I, I look at the club, I've always looked at my club, North Sydney, and say, uh, right, I know what I think of my club, but what do they think of me? And I always worry about that. What do they think of me? It's all right what I think of I might think about the club this way or that way, but what do they think of me? And I thought at that particular time, they mustn't think very much of me. To be doing this, to take that particular thing, that goal away. And once again, it comes back down to the reason that North Sydney has failed is because of stability. And I do feel, honestly feel, that North Sydney had left me in that position at that particular time. I would have taken North on the following year to be very, very competitive in, 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 the, in the next two to three years that we had they would have had if they'd given me the opportunity of three years. But however, that's uh, that's the past now, that's gone. And as I say before, I always think of what does the club think of me, not only what I think of the club, and it's a great club, and, and that was just a passing through. Nineteen eighty six, uh was a kangaroo year and when you talk about kangaroo years you, you expect the teams the dominant teams to actually uh, dominate the number of players in those teams and the north sydney bears you uh, you probably never thought uh, many would come from that from that team in that year yet 1986 um we took uh, the bears provided two players myself and martin bella to the 86 kangaroo tour and uh it, i've got to say it was a uh, for me, one of the, the greatest um, achievements that I've been able to achieve. When you come from uh, Queensland country, where I came from, and to have a dream and to go forward and achieve it within a short period of time, um, you know, I, I was, it gave me a very, very um, good feeling. You know, you're satisfied that you, you, you set some goals and you go and achieve them. Yet, you don't achieve them without, um, uh, on your own. You know, it's a team sport. and. And as I said earlier, Brian Norton created the team that wanted to go places, wanted to have fun, enjoy the journey. And that was a great, a great catalyst for myself, Martin Bella, to play the type of football we did that um, made us uh, be recognised by the selectors. It still ranks as with one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. Although um, the other extreme of that was one of the probably most traumatic periods I've had. Um, my, I played four games on tour, uh, played one test, and um, on a cold night at Witness, um, I snapped my knee, a uh, cruciate ligament. I announced that we would try to, I would go on a different tact. Being a little bit selfish about the team that I play with, when you consider the young people that come to the club with the George Martins, the Horries, and the Peter O'Briens, and the Jim Gillens, and the, the Bens, and the Dons, that I would try to rebuild the team a bit that way again. Bob Sullivan wanted a 
a youth program put in place. Obviously, our, our junior strength, although it was uh, was reasonable, it wasn't outstanding. So we had to go and look elsewhere. And uh, so we put this youth development program in place where we, we looked at everywhere for players and uh, we were very fortunate. We found Gary Larson, um, David Fairley, uh, Billy Moore, Jason Martin, a young, great young halfback we got, Mark Soden, um, Adrian Toole came up through our juniors, Craig Wilson, Chris Carawan, I've already mentioned, Noel Solomon. You know, the list is probably endless. And uh, that was one of the really enjoyable parts in those days because the money wasn't the, uh, the end all of everything. When I signed Billy Moore uh, as a young 17-year-old player, um, I got him for $1,000 less than, than what Parramatta offered. Uh, and I got him mainly because of the fact that he'd stayed at my place, his mum had stayed at my place, and she felt comfortable with us and she felt comfortable with the club. And in those days, it was a uh, it was a real good atmosphere to be involved in. The money wasn't the, the pressing point, and uh, players came to the club because they felt comfortable there. And they felt they could go on and do things. In 1986, I was I was playing in a senior competition. The, it was called the Northern Districts Competition around just north of Bundaberg. And uh, Noel Kavanagh uh, approached my father. At the time, I was only about 18, and. Um, Asked me if I if I well, if I wanted to go to North Sydney Football Club, and I our eyes lit up and I was I was I, I said yeah let's 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 do this let's go. I was going to the gym a lot and I was with Gary Larson in the gym who was this gentle shy quiet Viking from North Queensland amazing bloke and then you'd see him on the field in the state of origins and you'd think how can that be that same quiet giant and you think look. It doesn't matter if they're not winning. There are a lot of people in this club that are stars who are really committed. That was enough. You know, when a new coach takes over, it, it takes a little while to uh, to establish the uh, the style that you want uh, people to play. And unlike today, um, you know, they, we were semi-professional. You only trained a couple of times a week, not like they do today. Uh, Full time, so it takes a little time for for you to uh, implant your style on on a uh, or a coach to implant his style on a team. Um, plus, you know, there, there could have been a hangover from some of the players were were I think disappointed that that uh, Chicker had lost the job because they'd enjoyed some success under him. And I mean, I wasn't. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I knew Chicker and. Uh, I mean, I wasn't responsible for him getting not getting the job. I mean, the board had made a decision that that he that they didn't want to have him as coach apparently. So that's why they they uh, looked around and uh, ended up with myself. But I th I think there was a bit of a hangover from that early in the piece. Once um, injuries got out of the road and the team started to settle down a bit, they did start to play some reasonable football. Yes. Well, when when Frank Stanton came in 1987, he came in and he brought the broom in, he swept out um, the club, he came in with his, with his own plays, with his own names for plays, and they became basic, which I probably, I'm sure they're still used today, some of the names for the plays. Um, and he came in with the, 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 not the iron fist, but a governing rule that wasn't, wasn't gonna be changed, and everybody had to adhere to. So it was very disciplined um, under Frank. I enjoyed that, um, I, I got a lot of confidence being with the guy, he was, he exuded confidence. Obviously, his record in the game was, you know, was faultless, having coached the Kank Touring Kangaroos and so many times. So it was good to be around him. And he came in and and he developed the start of the professionalism in the club. You know, video um, sessions became mandatory. Um, training was a little bit more intense. Um, and I think you know he's got a lot to. Um, a lot of the credit can be given to him for the success of the 90s, I believe. Frank I liked a lot, he was a good bloke, but he, he failed to show that side of himself to the to the players. Well, I like Frank socially, I, I just can't, don't get on with him as, as far as football's concerned. I, he was catching my 82 Kangaroo Tour and he was catching the State of Origin game I played in 1982 and I just get the impression that, or I got the impression that he didn't like me as a player and um, I certainly didn't like him as a coach. And uh, he was, he was a big disciplinarian, you know, like a, he, one of those guys, if he smiled, he'd want, if he smiled, he'd want to know why you're smiling sort of thing, you know. The second rower, Ian French, made the initial break. Mark Cannon loomed in support. Andrew Simons finished off the move and the Bears led 10-8 at the break. Wolves raced in three tries to one in the second half, but none brought more delight to Bear Park 
than when McKinnon celebrated his record with the club with a try in the 28th minute as North chalked up a 28 to 14 win. Kokas has probably been their best player all year, but they've made a mistake here in North Sydney. Cannon for the line, and Cannon will score! Cannon has scored for North Sydney, and it's 6-4, and that is the sort of stupid error that Roy Masters has been castigating St George for all week. Now then, he's back in the game, and he realises it to Stanton. And there's Funnel's kick. He's put it between Cannon and uh, Lennon, and Cannon again positioned himself well and trying to position when, uh, Lennon as well to get up and play it. 34 metres out from his own line. Now that's Coromo. He's gone straight through. He's up over the halfway. He's got support coming up. This will be a try to North Sydney. Lennon will score, and this will make it 8 all. Lennon's in. That really was good football, but I hate to say it, there was two feeble attempts by the St George players, and I think you'll find it's Young and the hooker, Johnston. Beautiful pass. Now watch the switch here. Now we saw Florimo go through and then straight inside. Now watch him look. He'll point, say, come on inside, inside. And there he is. And Lennon goes in for a well-deserved try. As Norse have the ball on the quarter line and trying to pass them up this time and getting a pass away towards Conlon. Conlon down towards the St George quarter line. The floated pass out wide goes from Simons. Back on the inside, North Sydney continue the movement going through Cannon and Cannon's held up in tackle number five. Only 18 metres away, North Sydney's turn to attack through Friend. Friend puts the kick in and this will be a try or will it going for the line as Tate. Back on the inside comes Lennon and Lennon scores. Try! Out to Florimo. Florimo back on the inside to Teasel. Teasel going to pass away there to Lennon. And Lennon's in for the try underneath the post. My comeback game was against Wes in 1987. And I injured the knee again, unfortunately. It wasn't sure. Again, it wasn't sure how... Uh, great the damage was, the swelling had to go down and it was perceived that my injury was fine, I had stretched the ligament again, yet I should be fine, but in the off season of 87-88 playing touch football I uh, stepped off my leg and snapped it again and it cost me the majority of the 1988 season so um, in two seasons I played I think it was, well, four or six games in the bush, I had a knee reconstruction. Norse brought me down, I had a knee reconstruction. So there's a lot of rehabilitation involved in, in 86 and 87. And I found it really tough. I was, I was, I was a little bit homesick, but I, 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 as I say, I toughed it out. I grinded it out. The Bears managed to put it together in the dying minutes of the match when replacement player Gary Larson scored in the corner. But the Bears fight back was all too late. The final scoreline at Penrith Park Penrith 19, North Sydney 10. We had uh, we had some injury tolls, I think, about that time too. And you know, those are the sort of things. It's like most sides, as I was saying before, if you can.